metaphorically, it connects geographically, culturally, uh, economically, even politically, uh, east and west of Washington. The Columbia River is a defining feature of Washington state, but it's also a challenging barrier for cross-state travel. The construction of the Beverly Bridge, completed in 1909, was part of the westward expansion of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad and a major engineering feat of its day. And this represented a bold step and confidence in the future of the country and a confidence in the Northwest. By 1980, the route was closed, but due to its significance, the Beverly Bridge was listed on the National Register in 1982. Today, the Milwaukee Railroad route has been converted to the John Wayne Pioneer Trail as part of an effort by conservation, recreation, and preservation advocates to create a statewide greenway trail system. I think the intrigue with the John Wayne Trail for me is that it has span and distance and variety. I'd like to see these trail gaps connected, this being the most significant. The Beverly Bridge is the pivotal missing piece that would connect east and west. Advocates would like to see the bridge transferred from the Washington State Department of Natural Resources to Washington State Parks and rehabilitated to complete the cross-state recreational trail. The John Wayne Pioneer Trail um, is one of the crown jewels of outdoor recreation as an asset for the state of Washington. Uh, we see this trail being used uh, not just by people in the state of Washington, but around the country and frankly, internationally. I didn't get started doing these uh, rail trails because of the historic draw, but I found that when I do them, I have been drawn into the history of them. The bridge is owned by the state of Washington. It's presently closed off, but it's substantially engineered. And as a Washington resident, it belongs to you and it belongs to me. Anyone who would walk in that neighborhood and come across these buildings, you know exactly what they are and where they come from. In the last decade, South Lake Union has transformed into a tech and biomedical hub. As full city blocks are built out for both office and housing needs, buildings constructed a century ago are vanishing or being consumed by development. Three workers' cottages dating from 1911 are nearly all that remains of the years when Seattle's Cascade neighborhood was evolving into an early industrial center for the city. Characterized by their modest size and design, buildings in the area reflected the working roots of the early tenants, which in this case included a paint spray operator who worked at the nearby Ford Motor Company and an elevator operator at Smith Tower. The three cottages have since been combined into one building, and alterations over the years have ultimately rendered the structures ineligible for local landmark designation. At the designation hearing, it came down to the issue of resource integrity. And the issue of resource integrity is a problem, especially for these modest, more vernacular buildings. You look at the criteria, you figure out why the building is significant, and then you ask the question, does the building still convey its significance? And what is happening with some of the presenters and, and the owners is they're trying to jump straight to the integrity issue and, and start with that argument of saying windows have been removed, these changes have happened, so the building doesn't have integrity, so therefore we don't even need to look at the significance. Advocates believe that the cottages do still convey the early history of the Cascade neighborhood and are crucial to retain. The struggle to balance new development without erasing the past remains ongoing in South Lake Union. We will not be a vital, thriving economy without these small buildings and our middle buildings, buildings that are more modest. There's absolutely economic vitality uh, and, and great uses for these buildings. The more I talk with people, the more it becomes really clear that it is important to people. And they think about it not being here anymore and just thinking about it being demolished and that that's so permanent. Valley Washington's Little White Schoolhouse, as it's known by locals, was built in 1916 as an annex for the original 1905 schoolhouse on the property. A brick schoolhouse was built in 1917 and expanded in 1926, but of the three historic buildings, only the annex remains. The schoolhouse served the school district in a variety of capacities through the years, but is currently vacant. District officials nonetheless hope to see it preserved and have offered to shift funds allocated for demolition toward relocating the building to a new site, provided there is a viable community plan for its rehabilitation and future management. The Washington Trust has been working with community members over the last several months to put that plan together. 
we're really excited about the potential of the building being put to use uh, for community history. We want our kids to stay connected to their sense of place and help them feel kind of anchored. I think it can really serve more purposes in the future um, and so certainly a museum. Also uh, making it kind of an art center and a cultural center. It's really exciting to talk with other community members about their ideas and there's just there's so much potential. All parties are optimistic but there is still a lot of work to be done around fundraising and programming to ensure that the schoolhouse is preserved and successfully integrated back into the Valley community. The people around this area are very, they're resourceful and they're creative and they're hardworking and I think with those qualities and everyone just pulling together as a community, I think that it can be done and that we can figure out how to save it as a community um, and find those future purposes for it. Until the Eisenhower administration, when they began building the interstate highways, if you were traveling around Washington State, you probably traveled by train. Built as an extra fare car, parlor car number 1799 operated from 1901 to 1941 along the Northern Pacific Railway. With its decorative glass windows, fine interior veneers, and intricate inlays, parlor car number 1799 represents the golden age of rail travel in the United States. The car was converted for use as a beachfront cottage on Whidbey Island after its decommissioning in 1941. The owners, now wishing to redevelop the land, have generously offered the car to the Northwest Railway Museum in Snoqualmie. We are so grateful to the Shaw family for their cooperation and their interest in preserving this truly unique piece of history. Cars like this were once common all across the country, and so very few survived, especially cars like this that are built entirely of wood. The museum has secured partial funding to relocate the car, but the timeline is tight and additional funds are needed to support the restoration efforts once the move occurs. For the Northwest Railway Museum, which is an experiential museum, we see this grand opportunity to preserve this car, and uh, given the condition and construction of this car, we'll also have the opportunity to occasionally operate this car, where people would actually be able to experience an excursion between Snoqualmie Falls and North Bend as if they were traveling a hundred years ago. This is a big deal in historic preservation. It's not enough just to preserve the artifact or the property. How do you sustain it? How do you ensure that it continues to be taken care of? And that's part of our um, challenge at the museum is to find a way to ensure that it's appealing for the public to come and visit so they'll pay an admission fee or make a donation or in some other way contribute to the sustainability of the resource. We just don't assemble as a community like we once did so finding practical purposes for buildings with big uh, assembly volumes inside can take time. The Scottish Rite Cathedral is a rare and early example of poured concrete architecture in Tacoma and dates from 1922. Designed by the acclaimed Tacoma architecture firm Sutton, Whitney and Dugan, the building's style defies easy categorization. One of the first things you notice about a building is what it looks like and we sometimes pass judgment on the style and if we like it or if we don't like it, but buildings actually have a lot more value uh, than just their architectural style. Our buildings and our the design of our communities make each city and place unique. It anchors a prominent corner lot across from Wright Park in Tacoma's historic stadium district and has served as a fraternal hall, an events venue, and a church. The Scottish Rite Cathedral represents a larger issue of concern witnessed in urban areas across the country. The current congregation is unable to maintain the building and due to the high land value, a prospective developer plans to tear it down in the name of increased density. To complicate matters, religious-owned properties are exempt from local preservation ordinances in Washington State, which clears the path for demolition. What's happened with the Scottish Rite building is that it currently belongs to a religious congregation. And um, the developers, this has happened elsewhere, the developers want the building gone. They approach the congregation about using their status as a religious organization to avoid landmark protections and go ahead and have the building demolished. I would like to see Tacoma really tap into that developer network who are preservation friendly, who recognize the value in the opportunities in, in keeping and using old buildings. You know, I feel like Tacoma cares about history. We care about creativity and encouraging small businesses and, and you know buying local 
and supporting local artists and preservation fits hand in hand with that. So the landscape was a big part of the initial scheme and of course became as it, as it grew and matured, it became the, the essential part of the scheme. A joint effort between architect Charles Bassett of Skidmore Owings and Merrill, landscape architect Peter Walker, founding partner of Suzaki Walker & Associates, and Weyerhaeuser chairman George Weyerhaeuser resulted in the design of the stunning 430-acre Weyerhaeuser corporate campus in Federal Way. According to Bassett, the campus is designed such that, quote, the landscaping and the building simply cannot be separated. They are each a creature of the other. The interior design of the headquarters building also reflected this sentiment by pioneering the open office plan, which was free of any partitions, allowing the exterior landscape to be enjoyed from almost any location inside the building. It was beautifully planned and well executed architecturally and landscape-wise, and notwithstanding the company not be centered there anymore, I still think that we've done something of, of beauty, significance, and, and value. The campus was recently purchased by a developer who has expressed interest in preserving the headquarters building, but is moving forward with plans to develop portions of the surrounding acreage. Local residents are concerned that the massing and scale of the proposed new construction will overwhelm the site, adversely impacting the balance of the built and natural landscapes that are so integral to the site's significance. The axial relationship of the building is that it can be seen from both highways, and you look down the lake on one side and you look up the meadow on the other side, the view sheds were terribly important. So if you see another building as you look up the valley or look down the lake, it does real harm to the initial building. Advocates are also concerned for the futures of the Rhododendron Species Botanical Garden and the Pacific Bonsai Museum, two distinct and significant cultural resources also on the property. I think that the rhododendron species development and the bonsai in particular are, are valuable in their own right. They're kind of unique. They really are worthy of, uh, of a full defense of whatever it takes. With such an expansive campus, a certain level of development is inevitable. Even the original plans indicated areas for additional construction activity. Weyerhaeuser actually had plans for different buildings on this property, but they blended in with what was here and made it, enhanced it, made it better than uh, detracting from it. I would hope the new uses would be not totally incompatible with the, uh, the quality of that which is already there. Due to its exceptional historic and architectural significance, a particular care must be taken with any new development. New buildings must be sensitive to the original design philosophy of the campus, which emphasized integration with the landscape and environmental sensitivity. There's reasons behind why the building looks like it does, and the landscaping and everything um, from, from the architects and the designers. You know, we just really want to preserve, protect, and maintain the unique character. And I think what really has impressed me over time is the thought for longevity. I mean, it was a company that it took 40 years to grow their product. And then you have George Weyerhaeuser's leadership that created this. And he also put on this property, the Boneside Garden and the Rhododendron Garden, which are all long-term thinking. It, it's just special.